My name is Tiffany Ma. I am the Director for Political and Security Affairs at the National Bureau of Asian Research, but I also have the great privilege of being the Project Director at MBR for this wonderful joint initiative between MBR and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. So at the outset of the project, uh, what we really envisioned was that MAP would go beyond the maritime disputes and really highlight the full spectrum of complexities facing policymakers both in the Asia Pacific and the United States with respect to the maritime domain today. And what we're so pleased um, to have here today is a panel that really reflects the breadth of expertise that's involved in this project. Today we'll be talking about um, more traditional security concerns in the maritime domain, and that's um, relations within countries in the region, whether it's within ASEAN or between ASEAN and China, as well as what is increasing militarization and naval modernization, both in terms of navies and in terms of coast guards and paramilitary mean uh, for the region. And then we also have, adding to the layers of complexities, what do non-traditional security challenges such as fisheries and energy reserves, how does that play into uh, the complexities of the policymakers' decisions? So I'm going to introduce the panel really quickly and then turn it over to them. To my far right, we have my colleague at MBR, Dr. Tabitha Mallory. And she's a fellow at MBR, and she was previously a post postdoctoral research fellow with Princeton, Harvard, China, and the World Program. To my immediate right is Mike Herberg, who serves as a research director for MBR's Energy Security Program, and he also is a senior lecturer at the University of California, San Diego. To my left, I have Dr. Ian Chung from the National University of Singapore, and Dr. Chung was previously a research assistant professor at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. To my far left, I have Dr. Ian Story, who is a senior fellow at the ICES, Yusuf Ishak Institute in Singapore. Um, and he's also the editor of the Institute's flagship academic journal, Contemporary Southeast Asia. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the panelists who will all make their presentations in turn, and then we'll have an open discussion um, towards the end of the session. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tabitha. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to actually stand so I can use the map, um, maybe wake everyone up a little bit. You know, Hopefully, the coffee will help, too. I have a um, pointer here. OK, good. Uh, so I just want to thank you all for coming, and uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank my many colleagues and uh, the partners who have worked so hard on this project. It's been great working with everyone. So yesterday, I get into Washington, DC. And I will have to admit, I was pretty delighted to see that the front page article on the Washington Post was about the topic that I'm talking about today, which is um, fishing in, in East Asia. Well, this article is particularly on Chinese fishermen. So I thought that was pretty cool. A few years ago, this was a pretty obscure topic. So I mean, this is good for my job security. Um, but uh, on, on a more sobering note, though, I think it, it really shows, it kind of underlines the importance of these non-traditional security issues in, um, and their role that they're playing in these maritime disputes in Asia. And also, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, you know, kind of the global fishing crisis that we have right now. And, you know, this is an illustration of how that crisis is being played out at, you know, kind of local and regional levels and is starting to draw a lot of global attention. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the, um, the importance of fisheries in East Asia to start with. Um, so East Asia, the East Asian Sea, the Yellow Sea and the East Asian Sea, that's home to about 800 different fish species. Um, and then if you come down a little further down here to the South China Sea, this is really kind of the hot spot of biodiversity in, in East Asia. It's home to about 3,500 different marine fish species and about 500 different species of coral. So this is really kind of the richest fishing area of the world. Um, and about 83% of the world's fishermen live in Asia. About a fourth of those fishermen are in China alone. That's about 9 million people. And that's just the capture fishermen. That's not even including the aquaculture industry, which almost doubles that number. In Indonesia, uh, the number of fishermen there is almost 3 million people. So it's also a, you know, a huge number. So this, you know, fishing is really important to the livelihoods and you know, to the food security of, of the people who are living you know, on the, this you know, basin in East Asia. Uh, 
so we have this map layer, the FAO fishing areas uh, highlighted right now. And so these FAO areas are statistical or for statistical purposes drawn up by the FAO. And this area right here is um, area 61. And that produces the most cat, the most wild catch uh, in the world. It's about, um, it's over 20 million tons of fish. Uh, this area down here, um, area 71, is the second most productive in the world. Um, with about 12, about 12 million tons of fish every year. So, you know, these are just hugely important areas for fishing. The South China Sea by itself is said to be one of the top five fishing grounds in the world and produces anywhere between 10 and 16 million tons of catch, depending on how you want to count some of the illegal catch. Asia, the Asian population is a huge consumer of fish. Um, they eat about two thirds of the world's fish and their average, con the average um, per capita consumption of fish is about double the world average. So, you know, really important for the food supply in Asia as well. It's also important to the economies of the region. The trade of seafood um, just from the South China Sea alone uh, is valued at about $40 billion, which is you know, really a lot, um, especially when the global total is just over about $100 billion. But fisheries are under severe strain, especially in East Asia. Um, most of the commercial species in the, the Yellow Sea and the East China Sea have collapsed. Um, and the fishermen are going after much smaller species now. So the, you know, the catches are still pretty great, but the, um, you know, those fish, the, the, the um, species that they're taking in are much smaller now than they used to be. Um, the South China Sea fisheries resources are estimated to be as, maybe as little as only 5% of what they once were in the 1950s. And some of the species have declined just about 100%. I mean, they're, they're effectively gone. Um, coral reefs are declining at about 16% annually. And the catch rates from the South China Sea are decreasing at, an, are decreasing at a greater rate every year, um, meaning that, you know, it's just the catch is being, you know, taken in at, at a much lower rate than it, than it um, used to be. So, um, Carlos, could you put up the, the next layer, the bilateral fisheries agreements? So now, as you, as you can see here, there have been a number of agreements signed um, in Asia to cover fisheries, but these are all bilateral in nature. And so it's kind of this patchwork quilt covering East Asia. Um, and you know, because fish stocks migrate throughout all these areas, what is really needed is some regional fisheries management organizations um, to manage these areas um, uh, to kind of you know, cover to fix this patchwork quilt. But what, you know, what's stopping that is the maritime disputes that are, that are going on. Um, I want to say also that overfishing is not the only um, cause of the decline in the, in the um, you know, fish um, resources in the area and, um, you know, kind of the, the marine destruction. But um, there's also a lot of land-based pollution, uh, you know, from, I mean, China's a big one, but from all these countries. Um, there, you know, even air pollution ends up in the ocean uh, in the form of acid rain. Um, there's a lot of pollution from ships that traverse that area. If, uh, Carlos, if you want to show that shipping density, um, the traffic density. I mean, all this um, shipping that is going through the South China Sea, that definitely has a negative impact on the marine environment in the South China Sea. Um, and then, of course, there's destructive fishing methods like, you know, cyanide poisoning for fish and, and dynamite. Uh, and then at the same time, we've got you know, the, the problem that all, all of us are pretty well aware of is the reclamation efforts on the part of the Chinese and the dredging that's going on, which has um, reclaimed about five square miles of the South China Sea. And uh, <coughs> we have an example of that. I thought Johnson Reef would be an interesting example to look at. Uh, so this is the, you know, the most recent satellite imagery that we have of that. But if you look at, um, yeah, maybe that first image, you can see there was really hardly anything there before. And so what's been built up is, is being placed on this marine habitat, which is you know, full of coral species and fish species. That's all habitat for fish. And so, so really kind of the, the bottom line here is that the fisheries crisis is probably going to get worse. Um, you know, meanwhile, the governments of all these countries are using fishing fleets as proxies to enforce their maritime claims. Um, some of the reasoning for this is that the fishing fleets are civilian in nature, so they're less threatening for other countries. 
Um, and you know, it's, it's clever in a way too because you can imagine the implications of say the United States Navy firing on you know, Chinese fishing vessels, for example, that would look really pretty terrible. Uh, not to mention that there are so many of them that, you know, just kind of logistically it would be very kind of overwhelming for U.S. forces in the area. Um, and so we've seen a lot of, and, and some of the maps show some of the incidents that have happened um, over the past few years where you've got this kind of swarming effect of some of the, the Chinese fishing fleet. Um, I think, you know, due to time, I won't talk too much about that. But um, I do want to end on a positive note, though, even though this has kind of been a little bit of a dismal um, situation that I'm outlaying here. Um, Carlos, if you want to show the maritime incidents. So, you know, I do want to point out that there have been some positive developments. Um, this is one of the incidents we have up on the map, the shooting death of the Taiwanese fishermen that happened in 2013. And, you know, what's come out of that incident is an agreement that was signed um, between the uh, Taiwan and the Philippines on managing fish stocks. I mean, it falls short of, I think, some important things like determining how much catch should be allowed by both sides. It's not even really limited to a specific area. It's just kind of generally in their overlapping EUZ claims. But I think it is a positive step because they've agreed to resolve some of their fishing disputes without resorting to violence, you know, which is really good. And also Taiwan has um, signed an agreement with Japan um, just north of this area around the um, Senkaku Diaoyu Islands, um, which is also positive development. But um, as I mentioned before, you know, because a lot of these agreements are just bilateral, they're not regional in nature, which is really important, there is still a lot of water to cover. So, thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Tabitha. So we're going to turn to Mike Herberg next to talk to us about the potentially lucrative or mis mysterious oil and gas reserves that exist in these disputed areas. Uh, let, let me emphasize potentially, uh, you know, I'm going to try to try to cast some uh, reality to some of the hyperbole that we hear about uh, energy in the South China Sea. First, let me thank uh, NBR and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation for including me in such a uh, distinguished group of people. They may uh, live to regret that, but uh, for now I'm part of the, uh, part of the expert panel. Uh, I, you know, the real bedrock of these issues is, remains not really about energy, it's sovereignty, it's territorial uh, control, and I think it's also obviously about managing China's expanding maritime uh, reach and power. Uh, how do the U.S. and China uh, reach some sort of uh, new balance, or how does that evolution of the balance uh, evolve over time in the South China Sea and Southeast Asia? So those are, that's the bedrock of these issues. But I think of energy and fisheries is, is another example as a key kind of multiplier. It's, a, it's an issue that raises the stakes, which are already extremely high in terms of sovereignty and territorial control and the kind of the broader uh, regional power uh, geopolitics that animates uh, a lot of what happens. Uh, and, and I think a lot of the reason why it's such a critical multiplier is, uh, you know, Asia is this terrifically dependent on imported oil and gas. Uh, Asia is going to count, developing Asia alone, is going to count for two-thirds of the increase in global oil and gas consumption uh, over the next 20, 30 years. They, ha they have accounted for it, that share for the last 20 years, and that's going to continue. Uh, most of Asia's oil and gas resources come from outside the region, particularly oil. Two-thirds of Asia's entire oil supplies, total oil supplies, uh, come through the South China Sea, the Indian Ocean, Straits of Malacca. So these are vital, this is the jugular vein, in some ways, of Asia's economy, and it's, uh, it's going to become more uh, of a sensitive issue. So you have a real zero-sum atmosphere in the region about control over energy resources, control over the sea lanes, transit routes, pipeline routes, uh, are critical issues on the strategic agenda of virtually every country uh, in the region. So I think that animates the importance of energy. Given that kind of general background, I'd like to break this down into two pieces. Uh, first, there's the territorial set of issues, sovereignty. Second, the issue of the sea lanes. Let me first talk about uh, territorial control. Clearly, that's important because establishing uh, territorial control and EEZs gives you control over the uh, development of oil and gas resources uh, in that region. Uh, 
some caveats. Most of the reasonably well-known oil and gas resources in the region are around the rim and are within areas that are not really generally contested. So I think we can, you know, journalistic hyperbole kind of gets, uh, gets away with itself. Uh, second, the resources in the region probably aren't that big in a, in a, in a relative sense. Uh, as somebody mentioned, 11 billion barrels uh, estimated from the USGS, 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Asia Pacific as a region each year, just last year, consumed 11.2 billion barrels of oil. One year supply, you were talking about, of oil for Asia Pacific region. This, in the, in the bigger scheme of things globally, frankly, is kind of lunch money. Uh, 190 TCF of gas, that's about six years of Asia's natural gas consumption. So, th you know, these are not huge. Now, we don't really know uh, all that much about the resource base. As you go deeper and as we develop the deep water technology, you can go deeper and deeper into the region, and that's partly what's driving uh, greater focus. But in general, this is probably not a huge bounty of uh, uh, kind of resources. So I think we, ha we have to be very careful. It tends to be very natural gas prone, uh, gassy in, in the industry. That's a, whole di that's a much more complicated thing to be developing natural gas fields and underwater pipelines out in deep water of the South China Sea. This is not exactly uh, you know, easy things to do and, and cheap things to do. So let, let's be very careful about how we do it. But clearly control over resources of these resource territory is, is an important issue and often uh, what I find is that that energy and blocks and other things are being used as tools as markers for strategic claims and territorial claims uh, almost more importantly than actually worrying about control over those resources. So, you know we have the famous case of the Vietnam uh, China putting their 981 rig in the uh, within the EEZ of Vietnam in 2014 they've done that again recently in, in January in a different part, slightly different contesting in Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, you know, every state in the region is marking out blocks and giving out blocks that contest the nine dash line of the Chinese claim as well. So the, the, the region's rife with using these blocks and awards uh, and bringing in outside powers, you know, ONGC from India, US oil companies, European oil companies. This is all part of putting out markers for those territorial claims in a sense using energy rather than uh, being so focused on you know what these resources uh, are in that particular region. Now a lot of this can be dealt with pretty easily if you look around the world. Joint development uh, arrangements are very common around the world. Malaysia, Thailand worked out in the 90s a joint development agreement to develop resources in the contested offshore area there. I could point to a dozen of those. So those are available for Southeast Asia and the claimants to, to set aside the territorial claims for future you know, non-prejudice uh, and go ahead with developing those resources currently and you work out an agreement to share. There have been some attempts at that in the South China Sea uh, amongst the key claimants, but none of those have gone very far. Why? Well, it has to do with this superheated uh, political environment uh, and, and uh, all the things that we've been talking about uh, earlier today. So I think, you know, we have to be very careful about how we talk about this uh, bounty of energy in the region. Certainly there's some there, but I think there's lots of other dimensions uh, working there. The second issue, I think ultimately is, is, is fuzzier, but it's in a sense far more important, and that's the transit, the issue of sea lanes. Uh, two thirds of Asia's oil and gas supply essentially come through those Straits of Malacca and the South China Sea. Uh, if you look forward, you're going to have liquefied natural gas in huge quantities coming from Australia, already coming along from the Persian Gulf into Asia. One third of Japan's natural gas supplies come through the South China Sea from the Middle East, uh, and more comes from Australia through the South China Sea. Every state in the region has a vital stake, and outside the region has a vital stake in those sea lanes and freedom of navigation. Even Singapore is a huge product exporter into the region. Even India is a huge product exporter from its refinery system into Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia. I could go down the list, Australia's LNG. Uh, so every state in the region has a huge stake in the freedom of navigation uh, through, the, through the area. It's obviously related to territory because once you establish territorial control in an EEZ, that gives you uh, some say in terms of the 
uh, navigation and commercial and naval traffic through the region. China says it's only worried about military traffic through the region in terms of establishing its EEZs, and that it's there to, uh, to support freedom of navigation. Uh, but I think ultimately what we're dealing with there is, uh, to the extent to the region and Northeast Asia, uh, particularly are willing to uh, see the, this vital lifeline jugular to their economy turned over to the tender mercies of the PLA Navy. To put it, you know, overly blunt, but let's, the balance of control of those sea lanes, which has been obviously dominated by the U.S. Navy uh, over decades now, the region is obviously high, very comfortable with U.S. securing that collective good, global good, of these open sea lanes. The implications of China's increasing role reach impact on those sea lanes and control of those sea lanes obviously raises a, a whole set of critical energy security issues for the region. So I think ultimately a, a lot that probably animates more of the anxiety and tension than even territorial control and resources. So let me just finish with, uh, with that. Thank you so much, Mike. And I think you and Tabitha have really highlighted how non-traditional security concerns like fisheries and energy really become proxies for the territorial disputes and in the theme of what we're talking about, they're multipliers for the complexity of the disputes. So I'd like to switch gears a little bit now and talk about other multipliers um, that makes these disputes so complex. And with that, I'd like to start with Dr. Ian Story, who's going to talk to us about regional naval expansion and what we see as the rise of paramilitary um, capabilities in the region as well. Dr. Story. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, NBR and also Sasakawa USA for inviting me to this important event and uh, especially for the opportunity to be part of the Maritime Awareness Project, which I'm very confident um, will provide policy practitioners, scholars, and students with an invaluable uh, resource in the years ahead. Uh, I've been looking at the South China Sea dispute uh, since 1994. I was 24 years old at that time. And uh, trust me, uh, this problem isn't going to go away anytime soon. I fully expect to retire and still be looking at the South China Sea issue in uh, 20 years time. So I think we're really gonna need initiatives like MAP in order to understand the many complex facets of this, uh, of this dispute. So today I've been asked to address uh, very briefly the uh, naval and coast guard aspect of the South China Sea issue. Uh, I think one of the most important trends over the past few years uh, has been the inexorable militarization of this dispute, which is both a cause and a symptom of rising tensions. Uh, all parties, particularly the US and China, have accused each other of militarizing the South China Sea. The US has criticized, the US and other countries, of course, has criti have criticized China for building military facilities on the seven uh, artificial islands that they've constructed in the Spratlys, deploying surface-to-air missiles to the Paracel Islands, and generally using its warships, uh, and especially its Coast Guard vessels, uh, to uphold its territorial and jurisdictional claims often using coercive methods. Um, Beijing, on the other hand, blames Washington for militarizing the dispute by deplo deploying more air and naval assets to the region as part of its Asian rebalance uh, and conducting what it considers to be provocative uh, freedom of navigation operations uh, near Chinese-occupied atolls. Uh, China's response to the US criticism is that the primary purpose of its military facilities and equipment is defensive, uh, while the US claims it's exercising its legal rights to conduct foreign ops under UNCLOS. So both sides are talking past each other in, on this issue. I think, though, in truth, uh, all parties, with the possible exception of Brunei, are responsible for militarizing this dispute, uh, but some more than others. So when it comes to the military balance between China and the countries of, Chi uh, of China and Southeast Asia, the gap has widened considerably over the past decade. Uh, according to one source, CIPRI in, uh, in Sweden, uh, China's defense budget is now six times larger than the 10 ASEAN countries combined. 
that's 216 billion US dollars compared to just 38 billion US dollars. Take away Singapore and that number drops substantially. Um, greater budgetary resources have enabled China to increase the size and the capability of its armed forces, particularly the Navy, which is emerging as one of Asia's largest and most capable navies. And of course, that trend is likely to continue. Southeast Asian countries have also been increasing their defense budgets over the past few years and buying larger, longer range, and better armed surface and subsurface vessels. However, by almost every measure, China's military dwarfs that of its Southeast Asian neighbors. And that capability gap can never be closed, even collectively with the, the 10 countries. China's also been increasing the, the, the budget and the size of its civilian maritime agencies and has employed the China Coast Guard, the CCG, as the lead agency to advance its territorial and jurisdictional claims in both the South and the East China Seas. The Chinese Coast Guard and the Chinese Navy have also improved operational coordination, and that's been very apparent in almost all of the most recent standoffs over the past few years, including the oil rig crisis of 2014 and the Scarborough Shoal incident in 2012. China has added 50 ocean-going patrol boats to its Coast Guard since 2004, including a new class that displaces 10,000 tons. That's roughly the size of a destroyer. Uh, the China Coast Guard now outclasses its Southeast Asian counterparts in numbers, size, and capabilities far and away. And we saw this most recently with the incident that Shafir mentioned four weeks ago off the Natuna Islands where the uh, Indonesian uh, uh, authorities were forced to uh, back down in the face of uh, superior Chinese Coast Guard capabilities. Um, I think the frequency of tension generating incidents is likely to increase over the next few years uh, for a number of reasons. Firstly, the military facilities on the artificial islands in the Spratlys are becoming operational and that will allow the Chinese Navy and Coast Guard uh, to exercise a greater presence in the South China Sea, and also to bring more coercive pressure to bear on some of the smaller claimants, particularly Vietnam and the Philippines. The Chinese Coast Guard is moving further south to protect fishing vessels operating at the outer limits of the nine dashed line. So I think we can expect to see more incidents involving Chinese vessels uh, and the navies and coast guards of both Malaysia and Indonesia. Yeah, that's a more recent trend, but it's likely to increase. The US has promised more freedom of navigation operations. Um, the last two, China's act uh, reaction was fairly restrained, but we can't predict how it will react to future uh, freedom of navigation operations. Other countries, such as Australia and Japan, are also considering uh, FONOP type activities in the South China Sea. Uh, should China declare an air defense identification zone in the South China Sea or, or over the Spratlys, this will also ratchet up tensions between China and the Southeast Asian claimants uh, and other uh, external, and, and external parties such as the US, Japan, Australia. As we heard earlier today, the arbitral tribunal at The Hague will probably hand down its ruling this next month or the month after May, June. Um, it is expected to, f to rule largely in favor of the Philippines. Uh, how China's, respo China's response, we don't know yet. Uh, it depends, as Justin was saying, on very much on what the court has to say. Um, China could simply, there's a range of options, simply ignore the ruling or seek to punish the Philippines in some way by bringing more of that coercion on, on the Philippines in a number of areas. Uh, it looks increasingly likely as well that China um, could start work on another artificial island at Scarborough Shoal, and that will plunge uh, China-Philippine relations even lower than Rommel was saying uh, earlier this afternoon. So how do we tamp down tensions? Well, the picture is not very promising. Uh, ASEAN and China continued to discuss implementing the 2002 Declaration on the Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea. 
that is now 14 years old and has not even been partially implemented. Um, they're also discussing uh, a binding code of conduct, but frankly speaking, progress, at least from my perspective, has been imperceptible. I don't see any progress. Uh, I don't have much confidence in the DOC code of conduct process at all, and I don't think most people who look at this problem uh, do either. Uh, Singapore, which is now the country coordinator for ASEAN-China relations, has suggested that as an interim measure that the code for unplanned encounters at sea, queues, which is a set of protocols designed to prevent uh, incidents between naval ships, uh, was signed by 21 countries in 2014, that the queues be ex expan uh, expanded to include Coast Guard vessels, which are currently not included uh, uh, under this agreement. The US has been very supportive of this proposal and has even suggested expanding it further to include merchant ships and fishing vessels, which uh, form the bulk of the so-called uh, maritime militia or, or little, little blue men, as it's sometimes called, which act in concert with both the Chinese Navy and the Chinese Coast Guard. Um, China is currently considering Singapore's proposal it might agree to expand queues to Coast Guard vessels, it might. Uh, I don't think it's likely to consent to covering merchant ships and fishing vessels, though. So as the proverbial storm clouds gather in the South China Sea, the implementation of effective conflict avoidance and conflict management mechanisms is an urgent necessity, but currently it is not being given the urgency that is required. And on that cheerful note, ladies and gentlemen, I will end my comments here. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, and thank you to our panel for sharing three intensifying challenges in the South China Sea. And now I'm going to turn it to Dr. Ian Chang to tell us about the broader context of these challenges, which is what is the regional power competition at play in Southeast Asia? Thank, thank you, you Tiffany. Thank you, Tiffany. First off, I'd like to thank MBR and Sasakawa USA for including me in this project. It's been a, a great privilege, and uh, I, I really enjoy the opportunity to work with everyone. Um, so that having been said, I, I do have to agree with the, my fellow panelists uh, in, in the sense that the prognosis for uh, what's going on in the South China Sea doesn't look good. Uh, the, in, in fact, I will argue that the prognosis for ASEAN doesn't look good either, given all the pressures that it's facing uh, with increasing major power friction, with uh, friction uh, within, uh, among its members. I'd like to begin, though, by saying that, in principle, ASEAN can play a fairly important role in moderating, if not managing, uh, but not resolving, right, not, re uh, not resolving the differences in the South China Sea. Uh, the sort of web of relations that it has, um, the legacy it's built up for getting countries to talk to each other, uh, in particular to you know, talk through disputes and uh, in that respect de-escalate, uh, you know, draw out um, more contentious issues. That's, I think that's some of the promise uh, that ASEAN might bring and uh, in doing so, what ASEAN might be able to do is to lay out modes of behavior for various actors, claimants and non-claimants alike. Um, and, through the, and those mechanisms are ways that we could possibly avoid escalation. Uh, and the fact that as, uh, if we have ASEAN taking the lead on these, the, uh, these issues, what it actually provides is a buffer, a sort of cushion that can take the edge of, off uh, US-China competition. Right. If you have ASEAN taking the lead, uh, there can be a little bit more of a trial and error uh, that can sort of lower the stakes. We may not have such an issue potentially with escalation. And the fact that um, it's regional actors uh, rather than some extra regional uh, player that can uh, add a, uh, a degree of legitimacy to uh, any sort of interim approach that is put forward. And I suppose that's the whole point about having ASEAN centrality of ha or having ASEAN in the driver's seat. Unfortunately, this is not happening. What we have with the Declaration on, on the Conduct of Parties, the COC, the guidelines for implementation of the DOC, um, I, I guess 
if I were trying to be more positive than Ian's story, uh, you know, maybe there is progress. What we have are agreements to understand guidelines to appreciate frameworks about valuing the uh, importance of discussion. Something to that effect. So in the meantime, um, well, well, you know, while everyone's sort of agreeing to agree about something, differences are sharpening. Uh, we, I mean, the, this panel and one previously have talked about uh, the various um, uh, developments uh, in the maritime domain, um, the various challenges uh, between uh, the, the forces and the sort of official and uh, military and paramilitary um, vessels and aircraft um, that, that are sort of going on around the South China Sea. Um, just to recap very quickly, I mean, there's this uh, seizure of fishing boats, arresting of crew, um, the energy exploration efforts and exploitation of marine resources that get, um, that seem to sharpen, co sharpen contestation uh, among uh, South China Sea claimants and uh, arguably more risky behavior by, by ships and aircraft, uh, not to mention, of course, the scaling up of reclamation efforts and um, the I suppose the increased deployment of military assets, whether or not this is actually uh, militarization or not, I suppose that's uh, up for dispute. And amid all this, what uh, we should, I think, ask ourselves what ASEAN is doing as an organization. I suppose ASEAN is doing something. It's doing what it does best, which is to have meetings and more meetings. Uh, but we've not seen ASEAN put forward any positive agenda. In fact, um, I, I think what we saw in Cambodia in 2012 when you know, the um, ASEAN members were unable to come together on a joint statement really because of, of, the, uh, uh, of whether to include discussion of the South China Sea. I mean, that I think it you know, paves the way for what might be the future of um, relations w w within ASEAN and uh, between ASEAN and its various partners. Uh, the ADMM Plus meeting in November last year in, um, in, in, uh, sorry, in Malaysia where uh, the, the, the in, in lieu of a joint statement, there was a chair statement. I th there's been some argument that that attempt, right, is uh, it shows that ASEAN can come together. My interpretation is slightly more pessimistic. I think um, what you're trying to do in that case is to have a chair statement um, sort of supplement a sort of joint position, but what it does is to sort of kick the can down the road and rests any um, sort of low level of under common understanding on the position of a chair. And this means that a weaker ASEAN chair uh, would probably get us to a situation where you know, the, the disagreements bubble up to the surface more. And when we look at um, you know, other things that ASEAN has been doing, including the uh, you know, big event, the big meeting uh, in California earlier this year, um, there were, I think the optics were very good. But it's unclear to me, uh, at least on the ASEAN side, what the deliverable is. Uh, we might, I think, we should, I think, le legitimately ask, you know, wh why is this the case? I think part of it has to do with ASEAN's institutional design as a uh, grouping. It's sort of made to talk and to draw things out. That's really good when you have sort of intra-ASEAN uh, intra differences. It slows things down. But by that same token, moving ahead and initiating a cooperation, pushing forward on things become a lot more difficult. Um, and then there are the cleavages within ASEAN, the, the littoral mainland uh, South Asian states, the more and less developed Southeast Asian uh, states, the non-claimant versus the claimant Southeast Asian states, and they have different stakes. And, the f and this means that the degree to which they're willing to commit to uh, reaching some sort of understanding on the South China Sea becomes a lot more difficult. Um, and in this context, there is the issue of, the, um, of major power competition where, and also a rising China where I think when you think about a rising China and the economic opportunities that China offers, well, that creates more incentive to sort of for for states uh, for for Southeast Asian states who you know don't see the urgency of so of uh, South China Sea issues to say, well, you know, maybe I should just focus on cooperation with China and not worry so much about what's going on in the South China Sea. Uh, then, of course. Um, I think there is a strong argument to be made that China recognizes that there are differences uh, in Southeast Asia and tries to play them up. This exacerbates the sort of temptation that is already there. Um, then there's the issue of looking at, um, looking at U.S. commitment in the region. And here, I think Southeast Asian states are a little bit um, inconsistent and ambivalent in the sense that, on the one hand, there is a sort of uh, free 
free ridership mentality, f thinking that, well, if the U.S. can take the heat of uh, contestation with China, why not let the uh, Americans do that? But at the same time, there's concern that uh, you know, the U.S. may not have that much staying power, that the U.S. may not be that committed. I know these don't necessarily sort of fit together, but that incoherence, I think, is part of the thinking and potentially part of the problem. Uh, and there's no, the fact that there's no real sort of open discussion of this um, perpetuates uh, the, the sort of tensions uh, within ASEAN. So I, I guess to sort of wrap up, what this brings, brings us to is this sort of um, issue of you know, not choosing sides that we hear a lot about ASEAN. I think it's quite reflective of the fact that ASEAN is sort of, uh, as a grouping, uh, individual states may be doing different other things, but as a grouping, they're not doing very much. And what this leads us to is individual states, you know, like uh, the Philippines, trying to you know, look bilaterally at perhaps um, more cooperation with the United States. Vietnam perhaps doing the same. There's recently talk about joint uh, Vietnam-Philippine uh, uh, patrols in the South China Sea. What all these point to is potentially um, ASEAN being superseded. Um, and, and this becomes, I think, particularly troubling for a lot of the smaller uh, players in the region, because if you have ASEAN being superseded, if you have things like UNCLOS being uh, challenged, then the sort of rules of the road that all actors sort of recognize and smaller actors probably depend on a little bit more because they don't have other assets to uh, bring to the table. Uh, if these start becoming questioned, then uh, the degree to which uh, smaller actors can actually uh, have a say decreases. Uh, and what we're left with is a space uh, in, in Southeast Asia where contestation between the major powers, the US, uh, China, to some degree Japan, uh, become a lot less embellished, right? So there's more, uh, the friction becomes a lot, uh, a lot greater, uh, tensions p potentially become a lot greater, and there's no sort of answer from, from the region, uh, from, from regional states, and I suppose that would be a big source of worry. All right, can we stop there? Thank you so much, Ian. So at the end of the four presentations, I think we're left with a slightly less than optimistic uh, prognosis. And so I just want to kick off the Q&A by asking our panel to talk a little bit about their thoughts for managing tensions in the region, specifically joint fisheries management, um, joint development energy resources have been floated frequently as a way to promote cooperation in the region amid the tensions. So I'd like the, I was wondering the panelists can talk a little bit about how they think that becomes particularly more challenging in the context of increasing naval expansion, um, increasing use of Coast Guard as, as proxies in the dispute, and of course in the context of relations and dynamics within ASEAN. And while uh, the panelists are answering the questions, if you have questions for the panelists, I encourage you to come down and line up behind one of the microphones on the two sides of the room. Thank you. Would you like Should to start? Of course. Thanks. Absolutely. So yeah, I think that's a great question. and. I think it's actually been really unfortunate that the maritime disputes in the South China Sea have just kind of electrified the fisheries issues in a, in a, a way that just hasn't been constructive. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, so there is a real concern on the part of Chinese fishermen, you know, for their livelihoods, you know, for subsistence reasons. Uh, they, you know, part of the issue here is those fishermen, you know, because the stocks are dwindling, are going further and further out to catch fish, and they're coming into, you know, conflict with some of these other fishing fleets. But that situation has, you know, which has kind of a, you know, a scientific basis, and there's, you know, issues kind of from a scientific perspective that really need to be addressed there. But because that issue has been overlaid with this militarization, it makes it very hard to kind of step back to that level and have a, a good discussion about that. Um, there is not a great fo existing forum to have those discussions. There are a lot of regional forums that try to address fisheries in some form or another. Um, ASEAN has its own um, kind of forum to do this, the CFDEC agreement. Um, there's APEC has one. There's NAUPAP. PEMC, <laughs> COBC, AFPIC, there's a ton of organizations, but you know, which one really has you know, a, um, kind of the jurisdiction to discuss these issues? It's very hard 
to get people to the table um, when you just have you know these kinds of diplomatic disputes um, and you know military disputes that just really get in the way of, of um, this discussion and so I mean what that means is at you know other forums where fisheries are discussed you know, you'll have people from the Fisheries Bureau there representing um, these countries, but you know, like for example, China, you'll have a Ministry of Foreign Affairs person kind of sitting there, like looking over the person's shoulder, and it, you know, just adds this layer of complexity to the discussions. Um, so, you asked for, you know, cooperation ideas. Um, I mean, it's challenging. I think it's, it's, you know, it hasn't really gotten any better. To, um, I mean, really, what kind of needs to happen in the area is. You know, not to have these kind of you know quasi-formal regional organizations that I mentioned, but you really do need some kind of treaty, some convention that you know the the countries are a party to that you know really creates a framework for this. But it's it's hard to get people to agree to that when you've got these underlying sovereignty disputes that are you know just kind of forcing the issue. So, um, I mean, I guess I the you know the best thing I can say is more dialogue is good. You know, and really kind of paying attention to the the science on these issues and trying to get people to, I mean, really you have to try to get people to, you know, agree to fish less. That's really what needs to happen. But it's, you know, like I said earlier in my presentation, it's kind of a free for all and, you know, because there's no rules in place, everyone wants to get as much as possible now. But yeah, so. Mike? <laughs> well, very much like, uh, like Tabitha said, uh, there's, there are clearly mechanisms to, to handle De joint development to handle these disputes over territorial control of uh, development of local resources, uh, joint development areas, which which I mentioned. The problem, as Tabitha said, is the strategic competition keeps intervening, uh, and and so rather than energy collaboration on, let's say, a joint development area between China and Vietnam, being seen as a way to build confidence. Uh, to help ease some of the strategic tension. I've always I've argued this repeatedly. This could be a tool for re reducing mistrust, for building trust and confidence. Uh, in a small way, use energy as a confidence building mechanism. But it tends to operate in reverse, is that the control of the energy flows and, 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 and projects tend to be used as a club uh, that each of them use to beat each other with uh, to pursue their strategic goals. So the distrust at the at strategic level poisons your ability to collaborate at the energy level. And your competition over energy resources feeds back into your toxic uh, strategic environment. So uh, it's a matter of political will. The, tech, the technical issues are easy. But look at uh, one example, not South China Sea, but East China Sea. China and Japan have had a shoving match over the Chun Chao natural gas field which borders uh, Japan's EEZ claim uh, along the Chinese coast. Clearly it's in the Chinese side of the EEZ, even Japan uh, agrees to that, but they, they argue it, that field extends into Japan's EEZ. There should be jointly developed. In 2008 or 9, they agreed to try to negotiate a joint development agreement. Uh, and where did that go? Every time they tried to make progress on that, uh, some some uh, issue about the Senkaku Daoyu Islands would intervene, and the talks would basically be broken off. Uh, and within that, each side was constantly maneuvering that the language of a joint development agreement would somehow uh, advantage their, strategic, their their territorial claim with some smoke and mirrors. So uh, it takes political will, and, and the overarching strategic environment just uh, I, I have a hard time finding out. Strategic competition and political will. Um, managing tensions. I mean, uh, as I, as I said in, in my comments, I'm not I'm not very optimistic about the DOC COC uh, code of conduct process. But that's no reason to give up on it. I think they should continue to to push. You never know; miracles happen. Um, um, I think just echoing what Tabitha said. I think the real, the, the real issue, uh, one of the most important issues here is fisheries because uh, the fish in the South China Sea is crucial to the food security of hundreds of millions of people, and it is being rapidly depleted. And many of the causes of the uh, 
tension generating incidents that we see involve fishing vessels. So if I was to prioritize anything, it would be fisheries, uh, some kind of joint management uh, agreement. Uh, they do exist in other parts of the world. There are precedents. Uh, but the, what the, the, the problem is that then you run up into jurisdictional issues, let alone strategic rivalry. There's jurisdictional issues. And the real crux of the problem is the nine-dashed line because it cuts into the exclusive economic zone of every country, every littoral state in the South China Sea. Uh, and perhaps the, the arbitral tribunal ruling will provide some clarity to that issue. But as we've discussed earlier today, how is China going to respond to that ruling? I guess I'll take things from a slightly different angle. So apart from political will, I think um, regional actors and also, other actors who are involved um, in, in the region, both Northeast and Southeast Asia, probably would benefit from thinking about the sort of end game that they want. Um, what, kind of, what kind of order would they prefer to see coming out of uh, the different sets of negotiations and contestations that are going on? It's not entirely clear to me right now. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, ASEAN members, um, they, they seem quite happy to be sort of quite literally drifting along on, on issues. Um, and uh, what seems to be the so, sort of overriding concern is sort of their own sort of national interest rather than thinking about how do we want to um, design an order for the region going forward. Um, and so that, that needs to be resolved. And if, you know, maybe one of the possibilities is that ASEAN has outlived its usefulness, then what are the alternatives that we're talking about? That's not entirely clear. That's not even, um, being discussed right now. Uh, and secondarily, I think uh, for major powers in, uh, in the region, um, mainly the United States and China, they probably would want to consider uh, what, kind of, you know, what kind of order do they want to be in and where do the other players sort of fit in? Uh, because as I had um, uh, suggested earlier, um, having a sort of regionally based organization that uh, doesn't include either the U.S. or, or China, you know, al allows some leeway, allows some flexibility. Um, and so pulling at the seams of ASEAN and sort of uh, perhaps getting ASEAN to be less functional than it already is, maybe that in the longer term may not be a good thing for either the U.S. or, or China. So in terms of managing those sets of relations, how they want competition, how, how they want to sort of uh, work their competition out and how that might play out regionally may be something worth considering. Um, and uh, thirdly, I would also say that there are other regional um, actors that have a stake, that have a big stake um, in both the East and South China Seas, and so far they've not really been in the conversation so much. Uh, we've, we've talked about energy, right? So uh, South Korea obviously um, exports and imports and uh, gets energy uh, th through those waters. Uh, then of course there's Taiwan who, who is a claimant, um, Australia who, too uh, that uses th those waters a lot. They're not in the conversation as much. Um, and I think getting to any uh, basic understanding, you know, not, not even an agreement, uh, you know, has to involve these various stakeholders as well. Okay, thank you. So we have one question there. Thank you for being so patient, ma'am. Oh, no problem. Okay, great. Yes. Hi, um, I'm Samira Daniels, Ramsey Decisions. I wanted to pick up on the uh, last presentation, which I thought was really excellent and got to uh, several, as did uh, uh, Professor Herberg uh, down there, the, 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 the regional dynamics. And I was wondering if you could uh, succinctly and precisely state what you think institutional changes, uh, you, you've explained the, where, you know, the sort of broad uh, elements of it, but uh, I, I've been, um, Thinking that there are s these, there are some psychological dynamics that definitely get in the way, and uh, they're they're historical, they're psychological, and and they and they issue also out of the po post-colonial uh, period from 1947 on. And so I was wondering, you know, it, how you think, uh, what, what what you think can can sort of get at those the psychological barriers that I think uh, face some of these regional institutions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, to, uh, this was your last presentation. Okay, great. Oh, we we'll take one question at a time. One well, question at a time? Yes. Okay. So I, I think the point is uh, exactly right in the sense that 
a lot of the disputes that we see, in particular um, in, in the South China Sea, have to do with the legacy of colonialism and post-colonialism. Um, and basically, um, all this talk about territoriality and the sort of strictness that you know, countries are sticking by territoriality, um, that's something that is new, meaning post-Second World War. Uh, and we're superimposing this uh, post-Second World War framework for understanding um, law on, on sort of ways of, modes of interaction that don't map on very well. So uh, I, there's, no, there's no easy answer to that. And I, th I think some of the um, discussion from the earlier panel about historical rights versus legal rights get, get into this. And I think what probably needs to happen is that um, the actors in the region probably need to figure out um, you know, the, how much they want to stick to these sort of uh, uh, pr you know, pre-Second World War and earlier sort of modes for guiding behavior, um, or, you know, they, or to recognize that you know, maybe that was something that's in the past, and in the future, one of the ways that allow us to move ahead, get better coordination, uh, would be to have a sort of more legally based understanding. Certainly smaller states, I think, uh, would be more favorable to, to having uh, you know, uh, some, some recourse to law. Uh, but um, the, the here's where the tension lies, right? If you are a bigger, bigger actor and you can you know, push, th th throw your weight around a little bit more, um, there's not that much incentive, I think, uh, to, to, to abide by the, those sort of legal norms. I, I won't add much to that. I think uh, the, uh, the question is how do you cut the Gordian knot of strategic distrust poisoning your energy uh, solutions? Uh, and, and frankly, energy distrust, because it's such a zero-sum energy environment in Asia, you know, uh, undermining your strategic relations. Uh, somehow you have to engineer an attitude that energy cooperation and collaboration can work for all of us and actually become a confidence building mechanism. You've got to reverse this logic. I've written about this repeatedly, talked until I'm blue in the face around Asia about this, but uh, I haven't seen much change. The example I, I suggested for the, Senkak, for the Chun Shao natural gas field is a perfect example. It's a, t it's a small gas field in the, in the colloquial language of the industry, it's a pissant natural gas field. Uh, Japan, That's technical term. yeah, it's technical, <laughs> technical industry term. Uh, and 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 if if Japan were to get development rights to part of this, the resource, the seabed is too deep. It's too far to Japan. It's not enough to turn into LNG. So they'd have to sell it to China uh, to make to monetize that gas. So it, it's it's a, such a small thing. It epitomizes that you can't solve that small an issue, how are you going to really solve the, the bigger issues? I, can add, I, mean, I, I know you weren't really asking about fisheries, but um, I can add a little bit about that. Um, I think Ian and Mike were, you know, kind of, their answers really got at what I would have said, but um, just to tack on an example. Um, so in the Yellow Sea and East China Sea, there are bilateral fisheries agreements between China, Korea, China, Japan, and Japan and Korea. And what you know, as I said earlier, what is really needed in that area is, is really kind of trilateral cooperation um, because the fish stocks are going all through there. And what's happened is, you know, there have been talks, trilateral talks, uh, among the fisheries associations of those various countries. And then whenever there's some kind of diplomatic incident that happens, those, those talks are cut off. And so, um, yeah, so I think there has to be more of a commitment to, you know, some of the memory and reconciliation work that's been going on. I think the you know, the, the media from all these countries is, you know, also shapes the message and they have a role to play. Um, so, you know, there, there does need to be political will towards making those discussions keep happening and even in the face of, you know, some of the other issues that come up along the way, so. Okay. Thanks, Tabitha. Okay, we have one more question, the gentleman. Uh, Myself Vibhanshu from American University. I have one question to Dr. Chang. Uh, you mentioned uh, free riding behavior. It seems like much of uh, South China dispute in, in a way can be accorded to the free riding behavior, not just of ASEAN state, but also uh, China as an emerging power too. Uh, how do you see the role of uh, extra-regional uh, powers 
such as the revived rhetoric of quadrilateral initiative as a constraint on, on this uh, free riding behavior? Is, can that be a constraint or is that a kind of uh, push factor? Uh, second uh, question I have to Dr. Story. Uh, you mentioned about uh, um, militarization uh, of uh, paramilitary uh, forces in the, in the region, especially in the maritime forces. Indonesia, as, as a player, uh, played a pretty abnormal demilitarizing role in the sense that it has invested not even up to 1% of its GDP on defense spending. What would be the implication if it acquires more normal state, like normal defense spending role and goes up to say up one point half a percent or, or more than that. How would that translate in terms of the impact on uh, regional uh, militarization level? Thank you. I just, can I ask one more clarification? I think uh, 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 Tabitha mentioned uh, three million uh, fishermen or like people in Indonesia dependent on fishery. I'm not sure if, if that's like, how are you counting us? Uh, food and agriculture organization, the UN mentions some around six and a half million people. Do you uh, calculate just formal or also uh, people like involved in informal uh, fishery, just like, you know, uh, subsistence or livelihood oriented? Thank you. Thank you. How about we go in the order of the questions were addressed? So Ian, Ian, and then Tabitha. Ian, Ian. I don't think the number of I don't think the number of uh, agreements or understandings, formal or informal, matter that much uh, with the free writing issue. What matters is the content of those understandings, and what I don't see is some uh, co commitment mechanism uh, that. Uh, I mean, if everything you know needs to work by consensus or uh, really is just about talk, then I think the free rider problem will persist, um, no matter how many agreements you have. Um, while getting more st stakeholders in is, uh, in, in principle, I think a, a good idea because you know it addresses the whole basket of issues. But that also increases uh, your problems for free ridership. Um, and you know, there needs to be some thought into, uh, about how you would set up a commitment mechanism. And the discussion on those kinds of things, I don't think, have even really started yet. Oh. Um, OK, I, I, so I mentioned in my, in my comments, uh, nearly all Southeast Asian countries have been um, raising their defense spending over the past 10 years. Uh, the South China Sea dispute uh, has been one of the drivers, uh, but there are many drivers. Uh, keeping up with the neighbors is certainly an important driver. Um, uh, just an anecdote, uh, a, a Western defense attache based in Singapore, uh, he was also the defense attache for Thailand. And several years ago, he asked the head of the Thai Navy why, the, why he wanted submarines. And his reply was, because Singapore has them. There wasn't even a pretense of a strategic rationale there. It's because our neighbors have them, we need to have them as well. So what you see in, in Southeast Asia is, is this uh, trend of rising defense spending and sometimes countries buying equipment that's completely uh, inappropriate for their defense needs, really. So for instance, let's, let's look at uh, Indonesia. They're talking about, because of recent I events around the Natuna Islands, they're talking about putting F-16s and Apache helicopters on the Natuna Islands. Well, what good is that, frankly speaking, against Chinese Coast Guard vessels? Are they really going to send an Apache attack helicopter to confront a Chinese Coast Guard vessel? No, of course not. You know? So I think in general, countries uh, in Southeast Asia really need to uh, be more realistic about what their defense needs are. And Indonesia in particular, it needs to focus on um, uh, really growing its Coast Guard and also the other Southeast Asian countries, instead of these shiny new toys, they don't need submarines. They need coastal patrol vessels uh, in order to deal with, with these kinds of issues. So just a point of clarification about the, the fishery statistic. Um, so that figure comes from the FAO State of the World Fisheries and Aquaculture report that comes out biennially. Um, so it's actually due, th the next report is due out like any day. I was hoping it was going to come out by today, but um, that's the one from 2014. I, I don't remember what the breakdown is. The exact figure, I think, was it's not quite 3 million. I think it was like 2.8 or something like that. But um, uh, 
but you could find the, the statistic there and maybe a little bit about what that breakdown is in that report. So. Okay, great, thank you. So all of a sudden we have three questions. So um, we're gonna take all the questions in a group and I ask if you can make the questions as brief as possible to give our panelists time <laughs> to answer. So we'll start with the gentleman. Oh, thank you. Uh, Scott Tavari again. Uh, Scott Kaplan wrote in Foreign Affairs uh, last month that the U.S. should expect uh, more aggression out of Beijing and the South China Sea and East China Sea, particularly in response uh, to an authoritarian regime feeling crunched at home from a slowing economy. And I was going to ask for your opinion about how much of this is really political versus economic, considering that from a tactical perspective, it would seem that creating greater tensions in the South China Sea, and especially the Straits of Malacca, is the best way to completely strangle China's economy, like to get a disproportionate response from either a resurgent CETO or the U.S. Navy. Great, thank you. All right, time to the side of the room. Oh, thanks. Uh, Chris Nelson, uh, I do something called the Nelson Report. I write about this stuff pretty much every day. Um, <laughs> I feel compelled to ask a naive question. Uh, a what question? A naive question. Oh, naive question, um, okay. I remember I when I was a young response. guy, there was something called CETO. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've all many times said, geez, you know, there's no NATO in, in Asia and blah, blah, blah. Um, but as we've been talking today, I found myself thinking, well, you know, we, we want to get the Australians more involved and the Indonesians are being pushed into being more involved and they both have navies. And we, our Korean friends have a hell of a navy. Uh, our Japanese friends have the second best navy to ours, et cetera. Maybe we need to be talking about taking the risk of uh, of you know the August 1914 scenario, where in fact we're all really organized and armed to the teeth, and then we have to deal with this stuff because otherwise we're sort of pretending uh, that, that the risks aren't really there. And if we just got a code of conduct, well, we will, well, you know what? If everybody is really armed to the teeth, maybe that will focus the mind sufficiently to actually come up with some deals. But uh, you know, am I just thinking the wrong way here? Is there no way that we would get uh, uh, from the ASEAN members a, a coherent uh, decision to, to involve themselves in a CETO-like thing? You know, certainly the individual members are, are as, Ian, as the two Ians point out, uh, <laughs> the tag team here, uh, they're spending a lot of money now on arms and stuff. Maybe we need to organize it a bit uh, along the lines of what we've had in Europe for many years. So that's my naive question for the Thank day. You. Thank you, Chris. That's a great question. Hi, uh, Prashant with The Diplomat magazine. Um, I have a very specific question for Tabitha um, regarding the regional management issue that you mentioned earlier. Um, as you mentioned, there's a whole patchwork of organizations in the Asia-Pacific dedicated to fisheries. Um, if we expect tensions to continue the next few years, assuming we don't have a big change in the geopolitical environment, which, as Ian said, is probably likely, um, what do you think that some of these countries can do um, in terms of turning this patchwork of, of organizations into a more integrated structure? So there's a number of organizations, like you said, that address these issues independently. There's also a number of um, sub-regional groups, like the Coral Triangle Initiative, right. for example. Um, is there a, a particular model or some examples that we could sort of start building a, a more integrated network, uh, if you will? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Well, three really tough questions, so each of the panelists will have 45 seconds. <laughs> I'm taking volunteers to go first. Maybe I'll go first really quickly. Okay. Um, thank you. I kind of want to address the, the, the question about the um, Chinese economy. Uh, and then this gentleman's question. Um, so I think the question was asked a little bit differently than what my answer is going to be, but I do think I want to bring up a really important issue here that we really haven't talked about, and that is um, China's maritime ambitions in the context of this economic development plan that it has for the ocean. You know, and as China's land-based economy has slowed, you know, it's really kind of seeing ocean resources as a way to um, you know, kind of spur on um, the economic development, kind of offset some of that, that slowing down. And, uh, you know, so China's putting a lot of effort into, develop, into developing these different um, marine sectors of its economy. There's about 12, you know, fisheries is one of them. And so, I, you know, some, some of the strategic actions that China is taking does have this, you know, greater economic context to it as well. Um, and you know you can talk about McMahon's you know like theories about protecting 
you know, commercial interests at sea. I mean, I do think some of that is, is at play here, and you know, some of the moves of the Chinese are, are you know, kind of to, to protect those economic interests and a little bit of maybe desperation you know, because of the, the economic stakes. Um, as, as for the question about the regional cooperation on fisheries, um, so the organization I think that's most kind of directly addressed this issue is AFPIC. It's the Asia Pacific, AFPIC, sorry, AFPIC, Asia Pacific um, Fisheries Something Commission, uh, which is based in Thailand. And they have kind of taken a look at this you know, patchwork of organizations and said, okay, what can our role to, you know, be to like, pull these organizations together and kind of coordinate our efforts more? Um, so there may be a good starting point there, um, kind of an offshoot of the FAO. Uh, so, I mean, I think maybe, you know, a little bit more money needs to be thrown at these issues, you know, uh, just to kind of get the expertise together that's needed. But um, from what I've seen, they seem to be a good starting point to coordinate those efforts because that's been part of their mission, so. I'm going to up the ante. Who wants to answer in 30 seconds? Mm -hmm. I can, I can. Okay. Just the, the issue of the energy economy strategic behavior of China and South China Sea. Uh, the, the leadership is deeply focused on that import lifeline, that jugular vein of oil coming through the South China Sea. Believe me, they are. And, and if you say, well, what could go wrong with that? Well, how about a Taiwan confrontation? They really are believe that the U.S. would cut off that oil flow as part of a Taiwan confrontation. Whether we would or not or could or not, a whole separate question. So this is a very real kinetic concern of theirs. Uh, related to that jugular vein. Uh, it's not just some vague thing about future power. It's about that, that uh, real scenario where they worry about having that jugular vein cut. Thanks, Mike. I can turn to our tag team, Ian's. Okay. Can I go first? Okay. okay. Uh, Chris, um, CATO was an abject failure. Yeah. And it was a failure largely because of differing threat perceptions within the, the member states and different capabilities. And those factors still exist today. So when you look around Asia, there's a lot of concern about China. Does any country actually see China as an overt military threat? Well, maybe Vietnam, I'm not sure, but most countries don't, they're concerned about China. So I, I, I think talk of either an, uh, of an, a, uh, an Asian NATO is, is, I don't think there's any appetite for that at all in Asia. Uh, there's certainly no appetite for that within ASEAN. I mean, ASEAN even finds it difficult. You know, the most recent statement which uh, uh, ASEAN released on the South China Sea expressing serious concern, et cetera, et cetera, didn't even name China. So m military cooperation of, a, of a, an alliance kind, I think, is absolutely out of the question. Very quick last words. Very, very quick. What a super panel. Listen, uh, <coughs> you can see my subtle body language up here. But what a super panel. We've got to stay on time. And uh, just thank you so much. Great questions. Uh, Chris, thanks for asking uh, your question, because it's, it's not like other times in history when rising powers pose enormous issues and people struggle. Everyone who cares struggles mightily to figure out what is the answer. What kind of coalition behavior? What is it? So obviously, you, you know, we all read you. It's not a naive question, but it asks us all to think so seriously about how the heck we're not going to repeat history, and we can't this time. In a thermonuclear world, we can't repeat history. So in any case, thank you so much. And uh, we're now. Uh,